So I thought we'd uh, just start off with a minute of silence and uh, take a deep breath and uh, just get settled. Good evening, I'm Bing Gong. On, on behalf of the West Marin Standing Together, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's town hall meeting. West Marin Standing Together was formed after Trump's election to engage the community in resisting a far-right agenda. We choose, chose to call ourselves West Marin Standing Together rather than focus on the negative aspects, and we aim to create the community community we envisioned and to preserve our democracy. It's still very much a work in progress. West Marin Standing Together has a very active Immigration Action Committee and a Health Care Committee which organized tonight's event. We are working to, toward a more robust Climate and Environment Protection Committee and forming an intergenerational alliance for the purpose of bridging the gaps between the gen generations and learning from each other. We also have a committee of writers and artists which support the work of West Marin Standing Together with signage, banners, and community events. Our strategy and organizing committee is open to all and uh, interested in gathering input from the community. Here are some of the uh, events that have been sponsored by West Marin Standing Together and its committees. In April, a conversation between our former Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey and journalist Mark Dowie. In July, our Writers and Artists Group sponsored an Interdependence Day Festival of Arts and Community, providing the community with a diverse forms of artistic expression. The Immigration Action Committee has sponsored a number of Know Your Rights and document preparation evenings in collaboration with the West Marin Community Services in four of our West Marin communities. And coming up in October, recognizing our need for some levity, uh, West Marin Standing Together is sponsoring a fundraiser and a remedy for your PT SD uh, disorder, uh, President Trump stress disorder, <laughs> with uh, Will Durst, political satirist. That will be Saturday, October 14th at the Dance Palace. Uh, please join us by uh, reserving uh, tickets at eventbrite.org. And finally, the community is invited to our next general meeting of West Marin Standing Together on Saturday, November 4th at the Dance Palace Church Space from 3 to 4 p.m., 4.30 p.m. We'll get updates from each of the committees and seek direction from the community. If you'd like to get engaged, uh, visit our West Moran Sandy Together table over on the side, over there, uh, to get our e on the email list to be notified of our events, uh, dates and times of our committee meetings, and recommended actions. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight, uh, uh, Liza Goldblath. Liza is Executive Director of the Academic Collaborative for Integrative Health, a proponent of systemic health care reform. And she will introduce our guests and panelists and go over the format of tonight's town hall meeting. Liza. Good evening, everyone. 
I always have the slight fear on stages like this that I might back up a little far because I tend to be expressive when I speak. So it's wonderful to have all of you here. And the main function of this evening when we were really working with a committee was to have an educational panel where we could provide some information for you about local, state, and what's going on nationally, especially in healthcare. But we have a rather unique format this evening because we do have two elected persons here, both Supervisor Radoni and Congressman Jared Huffman. And one of the things that we thought we would do is we're going to actually divide the evening up into two very clear sections. And the first one, the way we're going to do it is each of the panelists will make their presentations. And then we'll have a general Q&A. And if you want to ask a question, please feel free to come up to the mic. We are going to be on a pretty tight timeline, so I'll ask you in advance to keep your questions quite short. But then what we thought we would do is maybe just get up and stretch and then have the opportunity both for Supervisor Rodoni and Congressman Huffman to really talk about other subjects that are affecting us again at the local, state, and national level. So it's a rather, it's a unique evening. It's a hybrid evening, as we would say, and I think you'll enjoy it. So I'm going to uh, start with just a couple of appetizers, as I, as I often refer to it. And these are things and data that you may already know, but I work in health professional education. I'm a member of the National Academy's Global Forum for Innovations in Health Professional Education back in DC, and I go back there three or four times a year. So many people know this, but I want to go over it again. We spend about $3.5 trillion in the United States on health care. And as you probably know, it's more than any other country. And in, in terms of comparing us to the industrialized world, it's often twice the amount. It used to be only the United States and South Africa that did not have health care for all, again, in the industrialized countries. It is now only the US that does not have health care for all. In 2017, the World Health Organization to which I refer frequently, actually ranks the US in overall healthcare 37. So I think it's always important to look at these relative numbers. And did you know that about 75 to 80 percent, and I know Dr. Anna O'Malley can talk about this, are actually uh, physicians treating conditions that are preventable. And instead of reimbursing for disease prevention, and for health and well-being, in many ways, we live in a fractionalized, disease-based medical industry, and one that often does not really emphasize disease prevention, health, and well-being. I work with many people, as I mentioned, back in DC, and pretty much all of us at the table, and we have 16 national health professional organizations at the table, and unanimously, we all believe in going for a single-payer system. And these are all the educators. So lastly, I wanted to mention something about health. And it's not only an individual issue, I think, as we all know. We really need to look at a society and create a society that understands all the socioeconomic determinants of health. And again, many of our colleagues in Europe and north of us really look at the larger issue on what affects our health. And I've always loved the WHO definition of health. So in its broadest sense, and in its 1948 constitution, they define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Isn't that a great definition? So, On that note, I will now introduce our panelists. So first of all, we have Representative Jared Huffman, who I understand just flew in last night. And we're so delighted he's here. He's a member of Congress in, in, starting in 2013, and he represents California's second district. And I wasn't quite aware of the breadth of that, but it starts at the Golden Gate Bridge and goes up to the Oregon border. And he is a member of the Committee on Natural Resources and the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. 
Prior to his election in Congress, he served for six years in the California State Assembly where he authored more than 60 pieces of successful legislation. In today's day and age, that would be quite remarkable, wouldn't it? And chaired the Water, Parks, and Wildlife Committee. And he served on the Budget Committee and was co-chair of the Legislative Environmental Caucus. Prior to his election to public office, he was a senior attorney to Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC. Congress, H Congressman Huffman is a member of many caucuses and coalitions having to do with the environment, labor, health, education, public transportation, immigration, gender and racial equality, et cetera. I looked at his website and I think there are over 39 different organizations with which he's involved. And he still looks awake. I'm, I'm pretty impressed here. <laughs> so we are so fortunate to have a congressman who truly is a model for the rest of the country of someone who has excellent core values and tremendous integrity. So we're delighted to have you with us. You. Then uh, I'm going to just introduce everyone. Okay. Then we have Dennis Redoni, and many of us know Dennis and have the, had the great pleasure of working with him on, on several projects. He was born and raised in Marin County, where his family has resided for over four generations. Dennis has lived in Olima for o over 20 years. He was the director of North Marin Water District, and I wonder if he broke a record, because starting in 1995, when he was elected to it, he was re-elected five times. Wow. That's pretty impressive. He must get along with most people, you know, and know how to negotiate and play well with others. So he has also served on many boards for the community and government organizations, including, and this is not all of them, Point Reyes Village Association, Point Reyes National Seashore Association, Coastal Health Alliance, West Marin Senior Services Assisted Living Committee, and the Golden Gate National Recreation and Point Reyes National Seashore Advisory Committee. Then we thought it would be really interesting to have two persons who, in many ways, you know, have really dedicated themselves to being on the ground focusing on single-payer system as well as Medicare for all. Ellen Carroll, who is sitting between our two gentlemen speakers, is uh, uh, the vice chair uh, for all California statewide single-payer, uh, I'm sorry, she is the vice chair of healthcare for all and it's in California. And the state, it's a statewide single-payer advocacy group formed 20 years ago to educate the public about the potential for a single-payer system to equitably and affordably meet the health care needs of the entire population. So Ellen is a retired high school and community college language instructor. She coordinated a federally funded vocational training programs for 10 years at a San Francisco Mission District agency and helped run a successful campaign for the city's first Latina uh, school board member. Her focus tonight is on the California single payer bill, SB 562, which I believe is still currently stalled a bit, perhaps. In the legislature. Right, and she will update, update us on that event tonight. I, will, I have heard that a, a really excellent caucus is for me. And then lastly, we have our own Judy Spellman, who is one of the founders of West Marin Standing Together. She is currently a consultant on healthcare cost containment and involved in health policy research. She worked at Hospice by the Bay as a staff nurse and at Kaiser for many years. Judy worked with a California State Senator, Sheila Cruel, and was her principal health consultant. In fact, she wrote two universal health bills. SB 640 and 610, both of which were passed by the California legislature, but unfortunately were vetoed by the governor. She is a founding member of Healthcare for All and is its first president. So tonight, Judy will focus on Medicare for All. So please welcome the panelists, starting with Representative Jared Huffman. Thank you. And you're welcome to come to the podium. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I want to, in advance, thank Vicki Leeds, who's going to be timing our speakers. And she's, sta she's standing right in front. All right, well, th thank you, Liza. Uh, those were great introductions, and I am honored to uh, be on a panel with two terrific health advocates. I'm looking forward to wonking out a little bit on health care policy tonight, and it's great to share the panel with my friend Dennis Rodoni. I'll just tell you, uh, I worked closely for many years with Dennis's predecessor because West Marin is a special place 
and we worked very well together. Dennis has hit the ground running, and I am so impressed with he and his team, and we are working shoulder to shoulder uh, in a great constructive way on behalf of this community, so it's good to be with you, Dennis. And uh, it's great to see this crowd here on a Friday night. So when we think of Friday night crowds, I, I think in other parts of the country, like Texas, high school football games bring the Friday night crowds out, right? In West Marin, it's single-payer health care <laughs> that brings big crowds out. So uh, that's kind of cool. So I have done 22 town halls since Donald Trump's election. And uh, if you count tonight, it's 23. So I think that puts me just ahead of the Cleveland Indians that just set a, uh, a Major League Baseball record for most consecutive uh, wins at 22. Um, give you a little history on my background with single-payer health care. Uh, when I ran for the Assembly in 2006, I campaigned uh, in support of single-payer health care. I got to the Assembly and immediately co-sponsored uh, Sheila Kuehl's legislation in its various forms and was proud to vote for it uh, every time I had a chance to do that. Uh, was elected to Congress in 2012 and promptly uh, jumped on in support as a co-sponsor of John Conyers' uh, Medicare for All legislation and I continue to co-sponsor that legislation. So I've been supporting single-payer health care, Medicare for All, um, in various forms for quite some time now. And I'm also supporting incremental reforms. I think that's important because uh, single payer may not happen this year or next year. It may take us a while to get there. I think most of us here believe ultimately we have to get there and we will get there. But in the meantime, there's some other things that we can do to improve the healthcare system and many of them will take us further in the direction uh, of universal single payer or Medicare for all type of health care. Uh, an example of one of the incremental solutions that we're trying to work on right now back in Washington, I'm co-sponsoring a bill to allow early buy-in to Medicare for people age 50 through 64. Now this is a really important demographic. It's the one that the private insurance industry really doesn't want to serve because something like 28 percent of these folks have pre-existing conditions. It's not quite as expensive as serving the Medicare population, but it's the next toughest demographic, and that's why there are special provisions in the Affordable Care Act to limit the multiple uh, of premiums that can be charged to folks uh, based on age discrimination, essentially. Uh, and that's why the Republican repeal and replace bill was so controversial, because it raised that limit and would have allowed people age 50 through 64 in that demographic that I happen to be in uh, to be charged up to six times as much as younger uh, people. So this is a tricky demographic, and I think um, opening up Medicare to early buy-in uh, is a great option for people that fall into that age group. Medicare, obviously, is a really popular program, and so I think it would be a popular option for people to go on to a health exchange and have as, a, as one of the choices that they could select. And some of the numbers that we've been able to come up with suggest that it would be really competitive as well. So right now, uh, the average cost uh, for someone in that demographic on, on the health exchanges, I believe, is around $13,000 a year in premiums. And we think that uh, if we priced a buy-in to Medicare in a way that actually uh, did not burden the Medicare trust fund, because that's important, we want this to be a positive for Medicare, not a burden, uh, it could still save several thousand dollars a year off that premium for people in that demographic. So it's an attractive idea and one that has garnered 35 co-sponsors in the House. Uh, there are some versions of this that appear to be taking uh, shape in the Senate. But I'm kind of excited that we may have an opportunity to move that into the conversation. Um, there's some activity obviously on single payer in the Senate with Bernie Sanders introducing his bill and I think 15 or more U.S. Senators jumping on as co-sponsors, that's a great sign. The, the House version, by the way, with Conyers has, I believe, 114 co-sponsors. So there's a good body of support, all Democrats on both, both bills so far, uh, but that's a pretty good starting place. Uh, other incremental reform ideas, Senator Chris Murphy uh, is soon to be releasing a bill that will open up Medicare as an option for all uh, 
plans, including employer-based plans uh, under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Senator Schatz of Hawaii has an interesting idea to allow states to open their Medicaid programs and to, to put that in, especially in areas where uh, there isn't a lot of competition. I have some counties that are down to only two uh, plans on the health exchange, but you've probably read and heard that in many states, you know, they're down to just one, and we were worried there might be none, but it looks like there will be at least one plan uh, on, the, uh, on the exchanges in every county in America, at least for now. Uh, so lots of ideas. Uh, of course, those ideas include things that we can do right now to shore up the Affordable Care Act, and we need to do that in the, in the immediate term as well. Um, those solutions largely consist of subsidies, to the insurance industry so that they will continue to offer plans in places where they don't really pencil out. Um, so there are things like uh, reinsurance, uh, cost sharing reductions, uh, various types of reimbursements from the federal government. Uh, we also, and, and there is some bipartisan activity to make those things happen actually, uh, hopefully in the next few weeks because we have some deadlines coming up under the Affordable Care Act and if we don't do those uh, market stabilization measures, plans are going to announce premiums for next year that are going to be really high, maybe as much as 20 percent higher than they would otherwise be. So we really do have a window where we need to act. But bipartisan activity in both houses of Congress to try to get these market stabilization measures in place. And I'm hoping we can get something like that done. If we're going to shore up the Affordable Care Act, we're also going to need to make sure that we get more people covered, and that means we're going to have, to have to actually enforce the individual mandate. Donald Trump has uh, set us back considerably by essentially ceasing to enforce the individual mandate. We're going to also have to promote health insurance and try to get people into the open enrollment uh, windows for coverage. Right now, believe it or not, your tax dollars are being used to run advertisements criticizing the Affordable Care Act, intended to, to actually drive down signups during the open enrollment period. It's really a, an open act of sabotage by the Trump administration. So we've got to get that turned around as well. And while we're at it, we've got uh, literally only a few days now to address a few critical deadlines on health care. I'll just close with this. If you care about community health clinics, and I suspect many of you do, if you care about children's health insurance, if you care about programs intended to help recruit physicians into medically underserved areas, there are really important federal programs with funding streams attached that expire at the end of this month. And so we're away from Washington next week. We'll return and have one final week, really, uh, to come together and hopefully extend all of those looming deadlines. I think we'll get it done. I think there's bipartisan support to do all that. But stay tuned because those are very, very important. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks again for including me. Thank you. It's an honor to be here tonight, especially with Congressman Huffman, my good friend Liza, and other guests, Ellen and Judy. Thanks to West Marin standing together for organizing this event. You know, locally, we benefit from good clinics and professionals. We've appreciated also a good relationship with Kaiser, which have made us very fortunate here in West Marin. The local Coastal Health Alliance has provided us with free or sliding scale visits ever since its inception. It's now a federally qualified health clinic receiving about $1.7 million a year federally or about $95 a visit. Thanks to Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, Susan Collins of Maine, John McCain of Arizona, and all the Democrats for rejecting skinny appeal, we have maintained Obamacare so far. But unfortunately, the current administration has decided to cut the enrollment period, I think, to about a month, reduce the advertising for signing up from 100 million to 10 million, and just last week, it was reported that the Republicans were again looking to eliminate Obamacare. There's no question that we need to continue the discussion around Medicare for all concerning what's going on in Washington. Earthquakes have become more predictable than our current administration. 
But I first want to start, and Liza has asked me to talk a little bit about local health care. Um, in order to start local, I think I need to start statewide and talk about the real value of community health centers for all, which are the backbone for Medicare in this, in this state. Community health clini clinics have contributed over $8, million, $8 billion to the California economy, representing about $200 for every, every person in California, and supported nearly 60,000 jobs statewide in 2015 alone, alone. And these numbers have grown in the last couple of years. Community health centers have provided $5.5 billion in savings to the Medicare system in California and $7.5 billion in savings to the state health care system. Community health centers have increased the care for the most vulnerable population, with a population increase of 25% from the year 2012 and 2015 and there's been a 33% decline in uninsured patients over the same period. How many of you gained health care coverage through Obamacare or the ACA here tonight? Thank you, thank you. Medicare provides a safety net for one out of five adults in the nation. 39% of children nationwide are benefit from Medicaid and 42% of California children. Should the Medicaid eligibility be rolled back to pre-affordable health care levels, federal operating support are reduced by 70% as predicted. This would result in an instant $3. billion economic hit and a loss of 27,000 jobs in California from the community health care system. It would devastate the local Coastal Health Alliance if federal funding is cut off and or the budget, the new budget isn't met, the deadline for the new budget. Um, shifting the focus to Marin clinics, Marin Community Health Clinics, there's four federally qualified health clinics in Marin, located at 18 different sites, seeing over 40,000 patients, contributing around 35 million directly to the economy and 75 million indirectly, or a total for $288 for every person in Marin. They create over 300 Marin jobs directly and many more indirectly. Community health centers see 23,000 patients in Marin that are covered by Medicare, which is a 142% increase in medical encounters since 2010. Many of these recipients are below the federal poverty level and the uninsured, though, has dropped from 18% in Marin to 8.65% in 2015. Thank you. It's a good thing, isn't it? I wonder how you say Obamacare is not working. Huh? And coming back to our local health clinics at Coastal Health Alliance, since ACA has been enacted, CHA, Coastal Health Alliance, has added 17% more users or patients, and 21% more staff. CHA's value to the economy, local economy we're talking now here, is 58 jobs and $8.2 million, or $1,100 for every Marin resident. They also contribute $1.27 million to tax revenues. In 2015, 5,199 patients were served with 17,928 visits at the Coastal Health Alliance. 71% of these patients are low income, below the 200% level of federal poverty. 27% of these patients are identified as a minority. Since 2012, the Coastal Health Alliance has seen a 51% decline in uninsured patients. Almost 1,000 people have gained, 1,000 patients have gained health insurance. 5,164 patients receive medical care, 332 receive mental health care, and in 2017, over 1,000 will receive dental care at CHA. Thank you. At the end of the day, health care centers has proven that a health care system for all is beneficial both to our health 
and in creating jobs. The message tonight from me is good paying jobs and health care go hand in hand. It's a great economic choice and a great way to keep you healthy. Thank you. Look forward to answering your question. We're going to get Dennis to write up all those numbers for us, and we'll put it on our website. <laughs> it's really great, though. So we'll do that. Ellen? Thank you. Um, I'm Ellen Carroll, and I'm here to represent the movement for a single-payer system in California. The way I see it, this, this movement that is uh, about 30 years old here in the modern era um, is like this. There have been people working for a single-payer health care system just on the straight road, gathering um, pilgrims as we proceeded, <laughs> and along the way, uh, instead of getting there right away, it was a slow road. We've had, we've had some stops, we've had some detours. And I feel that if we just keep going, that all the uh, nitty gritty work of filling in the gaps and the safety nets that have had to be done along the way to prop up or, or um, enhance the deficiencies of our market-based, uh, profit-driven, healthcare non-system uh, will, <laughs> forget where this sentence started, but the point is, <laughs> we'll swing back around eventually to single payer. But we won't be able to unless that movement stays alive and grows. And so that is what, what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I do represent the movement for single payer in California. We've always been proud of our state for being out in front on important issues with nationwide impact. At this moment in our history, this is the most important one we have to tackle. The primary reason, of course, is that it will bring new freedoms and peace of mind to every individual and family, while improving our personal health and the health of our communities and the state economy. And there are many other reasons, which I will get to. I'd like to start by acknowledging the big news this week of Bernie Sanders' introduction of a Medicare for All bill, which I'm sure Judy will be talking about. Senator Sanders has endorsed our California bill, and we avidly, wholeheartedly support the national bill. We consider the two to be complementary, I would even say symbiotic. As we know, national politics are much more volatile than in California. What we don't know is how long it will take at the national level to pass Medicare for all. And we feel that we wouldn't be here without Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign making single payer a household word. And we also feel that the energy we put into building our state movement will ripple out and support the national movement. If we can achieve this here in our state, we will have a working model that shows once and for all that this can be done. And what are the other implications of pursuing the state-based single-payer? Here in California, we have an ideal environment to grow the single-payer movement, a large economy with two-thirds majority of Democrats in the legislature, where public spending on health care is already above the national average at 70%. But while we have this more uh, stable and conducive move, uh, environment, we also face a big challenge that exists nationwide. And if we are successful in meeting it here, this will also have a positive effect beyond the state. I refer to the democratic dilemma. The Democratic Party is in the midst of what I consider an identity crisis, not knowing quite how to proceed. Um, a few weeks ago, the executive board of the California State Democratic Party voted to endorse SB 562, the current single-payer bill. And this is an encouraging sign that the Democratic Party in California is becoming more progressive. But beyond party politics, at heart, the single-payer health care movement is a truly democracy movement. It resonates 
with every other social, economic, and environmental cause that is similarly affected by the gross imbalance in power between corporate stakeholders and the elected officials they influence, and we the people. I think winning single payer will be a serious game changer in a country that has seen privatization and corporate domination erode the public commons so necessary to our quality of life. So I hope this gives some context for this fabulous movement that we are engaged in. And I'll move on to my two other points, an update of our bill, SB 562, and an invitation for all of you to take part in this movement. Well, it's been a wild ride so far. We've been knocking on this door for a long time, and it's just swung open in November. How many people here are familiar with SB 562, the single payer bill? All right. I, you know, I'm going to skip a definition of it. It, it will get a, it <laughs> The idea is guaranteed health care for everybody, one comprehensive plan, no financial barriers. Okay, dental health and vision included. Um, so that's great. And part of SB 562 calls for, uh, as best practices in evidence-based uh, care, complementary and alternative medicine, integrative medicine, as Liza has, has talked to us about, which in our current profit-driven, high-tech, low-touch world we, is often neglected, but which can be very val valuable for prevention and healing. Where's Vicki? All right. <laughs> well, there's no financing in the bill, in SB 562 at the moment. A proposed financing plan was announced right when the Senate uh, was, was getting ready to pass the bill, which they did, uh, grudgingly, in June, saying that they looked forward to the addition of the financing plan and other details as the bill made its way through the Assembly. The most oft-made comment by senators what they were, as they were voting for it was they wanted to continue the conversation. The financing plan uh, was drawn up by political economists at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. It was well thought out, I believe, very simple and politically savvy. This is what everybody wants to know about. How are we going to pay for it? I'll just breeze over the basics. It calls for a 2.3% sales tax with exemptions for groceries, housing, and utilities, and a 2% tax credit for current Medi-Cal recipients. This provides a broad base of funding with everybody contributing. The sales tax would be coupled with a 2.3% business tax on gross receipts, with the first two million exempted, which obviously makes it favorable to small businesses. There is a peer review being conducted and some tweaking going on uh, right now. Let me throw out a few figures uh, from the report by Robert Pollan, which is available online to put this financing plan in context. <laughs> right now we spend, are you holding on to your seats, $368.5 billion on health care in California. That is how much is spent currently uh, to, get, to get everybody having the health care that they get, while leaving many millions of people out. Um, it would cost $331 billion to operate the single-payer system, according to the Poland report, less than the, 36, the $368 um, billion. We are assuming we can capture $225 billion from public funding sources that are currently spent on health care in California, which leaves $106 billion to make up the difference, because there would be no insurance premiums and out-of-pocket expenses and employer contributions to private plans that now pay for our health care. So I hope that's clear. If not, see me at the back table afterwards. <laughs> so where do we stand? We have achieved an amazing amount in the past 10 years. In November, the Healthy California Coalition was formed, anchored by the California Nurses Association, and, and joined by many major groups, all major groups, that have been supporting single payer through the years, um, along with some great new ones that were energized by the November election. Authors stepped forward. The bill was drawn up, largely based on the current bill in the New York legislature, and the campaign was launched. The bill was planned as a one-year bill, mainly to channel the fervor following the election and the desire to act quickly to pursue a progressive agenda. However, um, after it passed out of the Senate, the Assembly Speaker chose not to advance the bill. Instead, he created, has created recently, an Assembly Select Committee to study health care delivery systems and universal coverage, with an emphasis on looking at how other countries manage to provide universal health care. We weren't 
happy about this development, and this is where we may be hitting up against what I mentioned earlier, whether the Democratic Party here, at least the legislators currently in office, are prepared to the last Democrat in the legislature to support single payer. Okay, I have one minute. So there's no assurance that the speed, we are hoping the best case scenario would be that this uh, committee convenes, has meetings, and then in January, the assembly speaker decides to release the bill into a policy committee where it can be amended and move forward. There's no assurance of this, and that's where we come to activism, the exciting climax. How can we help make this happen and move this bill? I won't beat around the bush. Please join Healthcare for All. Uh, become a dues-paying member. Sign up to volunteer. It's an excellent way to connect with the statewide movement. Uh, we do all kinds of activities, uh, film screenings, house parties, tabling at markets, speaking to Rotary Clubs and other groups, writing letters to the editor. Um, there's a volunteer form that you can get in the back table and check off your preferences. We now have a particular emphasis on working in the faith and business communities, which are so important to this movement, and to promoting our films, which I would like to show you. We have the healthcare movie with the emphasis on comparing the history and the uh, status of the Canadian and United States healthcare systems. There's Fix It, which is must viewing. Uh, this is the business case for single payer, but it really lays everything out, all the advantages and why we need it. So this is, this is a great one. And now is the time is the latest, which is really a call to action. So I'll stop there and thank you very much uh, for listening. So the website, Healthcare for All, is really worth going to visit and has an excellent FAQ. A lot of really good questions are answered on that particular website. I'll say them again at the end. So now we have Judy Spellman. Welcome. Hi. Um, I'd like to thank Congressman Huffman and Dennis Redoni for coming on a Friday night. I think it was very generous of you, particularly Congressman Huffman, who just spent, I must have spent the last four days in Washington, D.C., which doesn't seem to me to be a place where I would want to be. Um, so thank you, both of you, for being really fine public servants for us. We are, I think I speak for all of us when I say we're very grateful. So I am going to talk about why I believe that we should prioritize Medicare for all over state-based single-payer systems. But before I do that, I want to ask you to, if you would just, this was, I think, sitting on the chair. This was supposed to be on the chair. Um, because there is so much support for single-payer in West Marin, because I've spent all these years writing single-payer plans, I put together what I hope will be kind of a useful primer. The ver very quickly, the first page talks is about why I think Medicare for All is probably the right way to go now. The back of it talks about um, how to structure state-based single-payer plans so that they do not obstruct movement toward a national health plan and instead facilitate movement toward a national health plan. The next page is a kind of a primer on both single-payer and Medicare. There is a definition of single-payer and it describes what Medicare is and is not because traditional Medicare is not a single-payer system. Bernie Sanders and John Conyers have written Medicare single-payer systems bills, but the current plan is not a single-payer system. The yellow page is about how single-payer cost containment works, some of the basics, and on the back is an explanation of basic single-payer financing principles, and also a, a, an example of what I would call a really robust single-payer finance plan. There's been a lot of criticism by opponents of single-payer about how we never talk about how we're going to finance it. There is not a big mystery about how to finance it. There are a lot of ways to finance it. Here's one example. Um, and the final page is an analysis of the Sanders and Conyers new Medicare for All bills. Um, it's pretty brief, but for the, again, because there's support for single payer out here, I thought it might be interesting to, to have that stuff. So um, I want to make it very clear that I am not opposed to a state-based single payer system. Okay. <laughs> however, however, 
I think we should prioritize Medicare for all and look at our state-based 562 as a backup strategy for a number of reasons. Let me go over them very quickly. Um, I think there are major advantages that a national plan, <clears throat> excuse me, will have over a state-based plan. Let me give you five of the policy advantages of a national Medicare for All plan, and then five of the political advantages, in my view, of going for a uh, Medicare for All plan. First, using state single-payer plans as a backup strategy. Um, the first advantage is in the administration of a single-payer plan. Medicare for All, or Medicare, the, even the existing Medicare plan, already has an administrative structure, a nationwide administrative structure. No state, including California, has statewide administrative structure that could run a statewide plan. They're going to have to build it, and it's going to be complicated and expensive. The second advantage of prioritizing a Medicare for All plan over a state-based plan has to do with cost containment. Right? Costs are driving things, the costs are going up, the co costs seem out of control. Medicare has, a, a national plan would have an enormous advantage over a state plan because the, the cost drivers exist on a national scale. And one of the reasons we in California have not been able to resolve them is because they aren't just based in California. Um, a, a, national, state, a state single payer plan would be at a tremendous disadvantage trying to control costs um, and I think that needs to be taken into consideration when making a political decision about where to spend our time. The third advantage, I think, of a Medicare for All plan, Medicare for All single payer plan, you understand, not traditional Medicare, but a Medicare single payer plan, has to do with this concept of a risk pool. A risk pool basically means a group of people who are in the same health care plan. But a good risk pool, a big, diverse risk pool, allows the premiums or the taxes, however it's paid for, of the people who are well at that time to help pay for the care of people who are sick at that time. At some point, we'll be sick and people who are well will pay for us. It's not like this, you're just giving people your money. A state-based risk pool, a single-payer risk pool, even if everyone in the state was in, doesn't compare in its diversity and its cost containment power. Now, it's a big subject, but it's also true. The fourth advantage of a national health care plan, a Medicare for all single payer plan, is the purchasing power of the U.S. government. The U.S. purchasing power at the national level is already well established. The government service agency negotiates um, discounts for drugs and medical equipment up to 40 to 70 percent of what you and I are paying. The only group that's getting those discounts right now is the military. But, in, but Sanders' bill includes use, using pegging prices to, the, um, to, those, to, to those prices, to the, the military prices. The state has no, the state of California, no state, has no purchasing bureaucracy. It's not a small thing to create a purchasing bureaucracy. And I think the idea that California would somehow be allowed by the Trump government to, to, to access the GSA, the Government Service Agency discounts, I think it's very unrealistic. And so I think, once again, a national plan is going to much more dramatically lower the cost of medications and, um, and medical equipment. The fifth advantage, I think, in terms of policy is, maybe this is a little bit too wonky, but it has to do with access to federal monies, the whole waiver issue. Medicare for all would have, Medicare for all at the national level, would ha have direct access to all the monies that now pay for Medicare, Medicaid, Children's Health Insurance Plan, et cetera. States like California would have to go through a complex legal and political process to get access to that money. And I think our chances of getting it are, are narrow. And if we don't get those waivers, then we would have to maintain separate funds for Medicare, Medi-Cal, and all the other programs, which is going to be costly and, and really problematic. OK. There's a lot of other policy advantages, but let's skip to the um, political advantages, in my view, of a Medicare for all campaign over a single payer, state-based single payer campaign. Number one, Medicare is a popular program, and it is familiar to almost all Americans. By contrast, I think the majority of people in this country 
have little or no understanding of what single payer really is and what it could do for us, and sure, that's because the insurance companies have been very effective in propagandizing against it, but I do not believe that single payer advocates, of which I am one, that we have neither the manpower nor the money to effectively counter the incredibly, the power of the opponents of single payer. Um, the second advantage, I think, to a Medicare for all plan over a state-based single payer plan is that I believe insurers are much more likely to support a Medicare for all plan in which they have a role. Remember, the private insurers now administer 80% of Medicare. They're not, and they will, and it's very lucrative, and in Bernie's plan, I should call him Bernie, I don't know him. That's, in Senator Sanders' plan, um, the insurance companies maintain a role. The, uh, California and all the other state, state single-payer plans have eliminated the role for the insurance companies besides the fact that we need them to administer the health care system. We need them to administer the health care system. We also need to soften their opposition. And to me, eliminating those plans, as 562 does, is not the plans. We are going to eliminate private insurance plans, but eliminating the, the role of insurers in the health care system is a drastic strategic mistake. Okay, the fourth, there's only two more. The fourth advantage, I think, of a Medicare for All campaign over a state-based single-payer campaign is that there are two national single-payer bills that are actually in play at this time. The Sanders bill and John Conyers bill. And for the first time in our history, the majority of the Democratic caucus in the House, where Congressman Huffman works, and 16 U.S. senators are backing this plan. I, mean, I say, let's take this support out for a spin right now, and let's try see what we can do with it. And, and I think, in all honesty, I think the chances of 562, the California bill, coming back into play may be small, because I believe Governor Brown does not want it in play for a variety of political reasons that we won't go into. Um, and the final th reason I think that we should give serious thought to prioritizing Medicare for all rather than a state-based plan is because I believe that organizing a national campaign for something as popular as Medicare could build a unified national political voice that could act beyond health care, which I believe is going to be critical to stopping Donald Trump and the far right wing in this country. And I really fear that if we have multiple state-based single payer plans, it's going to fracture the unified political voice that we need. So don't get me wrong, if we, use, if we end up doing a state-based plan, that's great, but I think at least consideration should be given in this community to how we're going to spend our time and whatever energy we have um, for political activities. Thank you. So are your brains full, as we would say a bit here? So a lot of numbers go around. In one way, it's rather complicated. In another way, it's not. And we've had a wide variety of opinions tonight. Um, I recently read a poll, and they say that over 60% of Americans now actually believe there should be health care for all. And I can't recall it ever being quite this large. So that's a remarkable victory right there. I mean, it really is that people actually feel now it should be a right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open it up for Q&A. And some people sent in questions. And otherwise, if you have them, please go up to the mic. Once again, I'll ask people to keep their questions short, about a minute, maybe two at the most. And I'll ask, also ask our speakers to keep their answers succinct. So please feel free to come up to the mic. And I'm going to start with one my prerogative as being the moderator. And I wanted to ask um, Representative Huffman if you could say a little bit more about the status of the ACA and also how you see healthcare moving at the national level. Well, I think it's good news and bad news with the ACA. You've heard some of the numbers from Supervisor Rodoni. Uh, in terms of the progress that we've made uh, with rural hospitals and community clinics and Indian health services and, and just numbers across the board in terms of getting people covered for the first time. Um, it's really an impressive story, I think. 
Um, in terms of holding down costs and keeping premiums low, you know, there's, there's some leakage there uh, because uh, this is a model that really depends on competition to do that, and that competition doesn't really exist in some places. In fact, uh, we just lost one of our major carriers here in Marin, right? Anthem is pulling out of Marin. Uh, that means thousands of people who have that plan are going to have to, fortunately there's, you know, a handful of other plans for them to choose from and everyone will, everyone will find something, I'm sure. Um, but uh, it could get a lot worse if those subsidies uh, on which participation in lots of markets depend go away. And Donald Trump is sending all sorts of mixed messages, injecting uncertainty uh, that has caused a lot of carriers to pull out or to hedge by putting out signals for really high premiums next year. Uh, I think what Congress is able to come together and do in the next few weeks to try to make those permanent will have a lot to do with whether the Affordable Care Act continues to be looked on fairly favorably. I mean, the numbers in favor of the Affordable Care Act are surprisingly good right now, uh, considering where they have been historically. Uh, but if those premiums start going up 20, 30, 40 percent, that could change. Politically, I think the, the moment of greatest risk for repeal or so-called repeal and replace is past, but uh, no one should be uh, super sanguine about that. There are going to be continuing efforts to either sabotage it or to outright repeal it. Uh, I, th I think we got the votes to stop that. The best thing we can do, though, is to get that market stabilization in place. Because that really does, it, if we can do that, and we'll know in the next month or so, but if we can do that, that really means the Affordable Care Act is going to continue as the law of the land uh, for the foreseeable future. And then we can talk about all the, all the improvements that we need to make. Thank you. Now we'll start with the first question from the audience. Thank you. My name is Sky Nelson. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all of you for working so hard in this direction for so many years in your various ways. I think we all are on the same page here. Uh, what's interesting to me is looking underneath the dialogue beyond the issues at what's stopping people from agreeing and coming to common ground. And it does seem to me like underneath all of these issues around health care is the financial question. Everyone might support health care if, if it was paid for, but the question is how do we do that? My question that I really don't know about is how um, is it possible in a system that we have now which has a lot going on, there's a lot of, um, a lot of pieces to the puzzle, a lot of complexity around different costs that are changing in various ways, do we need to rethink the way that we as individuals relate to health care and what we expect from the system that it can, that can solve every problem that comes up or, I mean, we don't have a lot of dialogue around, as far as I, I'm aware of, around what we expect from a health care system. And so I'm wondering, can we afford the type of system we have now in the way that we're trying to do or is that, is that a, do we need to change that expectation? Is there a panelist that would like to respond to that? I wouldn't mind saying that in the Pollen report, they estimated that if we want to have the kind of health care system we want, which I assume we all agree is guaranteed for everybody with no financial barrier, one comprehensive plan that's as equitable as we can make it. Um, if we try to do that under the current way we finance and structure health care, it would cost $404 billion. Right now, we're spending $368 billion. So we cannot get there the way we do it now. And as Judy was explaining, one big risk pool, whether it's the state or the nation, whichever comes first, um, is the way to go. And it needs to be publicly financed, and we have to get the 20 to 30 percent waste out of the market-based uh, system that we have. I don't know if people are aware of it, but of the 3.5 trillion, anywhere between 20 and 25 percent does go to our uh, insurance companies, and I think we're all pretty aware of some of the salaries that are going on with uh, CEOs of insurance companies, and I think that one of the elements we do have to look at in cost containment is around us having really more a medical industry uh, uh, with a, a fairly influential for-profit element. Any other panelists? That, go ahead, Judy. First of all, it's really nice to see Sky. Okay. The last time I saw Sky, he was, I think, five years old. Oh. <laughs> I can't believe it. 
So are you asking Sky whether it's unrealistic to expect you know, a, a universal health care system that can really meet our health needs? Is that what you're saying? Actually, no. Thank you for asking. I'm, I'm asking myself what kind of expectation do I need to have about when I need to see a doctor and what the doctor mm -hmm. can do for me. Right, right. And we have a very high set of expectations in this country about what doctors can do for us. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a set of standards that are extremely tight and very expensive, I think, if yes. I understand correctly. Yeah. I, this is not a very scientific answer, but I think it's completely safe to have all the expectations that I think you have. I really think it can be done. And when you start to look, maybe you'd feel more optimistic about what you can get out of the system. If you take a look at what the other industrialized democracies do in their systems, there's some really wonderful stuff that they do. Once they decide they're going to have a national plan, they're going to fund a national plan, they're going to plan how things are going to work. So I think your expectations really can be met, not in the current environment, though. But, Sing. Next person. For, I, I sort oh, of, I sort of hear you asking a, a little bit of a different question, Sky. <laughs> we keep bringing it back to insurance, but your question actually underscores the fact that there's more to healthcare than just insurance. Uh, there's a lot more we're going to need to do to be a healthy country, besides figure out the most efficient way to pay the bill. Uh, so, single payer or not, we've got to make sure physicians aren't prescribing opioids like Tic Tacs to everybody that walks in the door. We're going to have to make sure that mental health coverage and substance abuse treatment is taken care of. There is just uh, a sobering array of issues we're going to have to tackle if we're going to be healthy. And ideally, uh, we would get to the point where we don't go to the doctor when we don't need to, where we don't pay for procedures and scans and all these crazy things that drive up the cost of health care in this country more than any other country in the world just because folks can make a buck off all those procedures. Uh, so I think we've got a lot of work to do way beyond this question of insurance, and I don't have the answer for you. What should we expect of our health care system? But I think we've got to start having that conversation. Uh, just quickly. Just quickly, I think it's important, Sky, thanks for the question. It's important to recognize there's a tremendous amount of lack of efficiencies in the medical world, too. And we should need to take advantage of those. But also, I think it, we shouldn't expect that we would get a free ride. I think we have many, many people who need free rides, but the working people will have to pay something. I'm convinced of that through employer payroll or something to keep contributing to help the system. Because I, I think it's unrealistic to think in our country, we can have the kind of medical health care we have without paying something for it. Actually, the Affordable Care Act has quite a bit in it about prevention and mm -hmm. about wellness. The issue is that states actually need to write the rules and regs and put them into practice. The real flaw of it so far is while there's some cost containment around the accountable care organizations, right. it's not really sufficient. Let's go on to the next question. Thank you. My name is Michelle Stone from Inverness. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight. This is wonderful. I have a very simple question. I, I'm trying to stay really positive about where we stand today and politics and that. I'm, I want to look forward. Uh, real disappointed to hear that Governor Brown was not for this. I don't understand it. He's for so many other things that are important for California. But uh, I think um, there's a really good possibility that Gavin Newsom will be our next governor. And I wonder if any of you know where he stands today with all our health care. Yeah, go ahead, Ellen. Well, <laughs> um, a while back, the California nurses endorsed him for governor because he was for single payer. Mm -hmm. uh, lately, he hasn't been talking about single payer. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, he was mayor uh, when they had Healthy San Francisco. And what that program did was it created another safety net in a way. It created a public program for people, everybody who was uninsured. If you did not have insurance, you come and you can get insurance through Healthy California. They charged businesses a certain percentage uh, that weren't supporting uh, health care for their, their um, employees. So he is talking now, I think, about some kind of hybrid, uh, some other kind of um, system that's not single payer. That's the latest I've heard. Can I add so, something about Governor Brown? I, mean, I want him to support single payer too, but I think that, that he, California under Governor Brown created one of the best health exchanges, Obamacare health exchange in the United States. I think Brown is very proud of it. 
I think he's accomplished a lot, and I think he's probably standing with Congressman Huffman in the sense of we need to right now pay attention to saving it. Um, I don't think Jerry Brown is opposed to single payer, but I think he is positive about the Affordable Care Act and is putting his priorities there. I, I wouldn't give up hope on Jerry Brown, but ACA is first for him. We, yeah. okay. we have quite a long line at the mic, and we only have gone through two individuals. And if people could just keep their questions very succinct, and perhaps uh, now one panelist could respond, <laughs> and we'll try and move it along. We will stop no matter what at nine, but we are all also are hoping that we can have both uh, Congressman Huffman and uh, Supervisor Rodoni respond to some other issues. But please keep the question uh, quite short. My name is Julie Ager. I live in Lagunitas. And my question really doesn't have an answer. I'm just putting it out because Donald Trump's answers and what he's putting out is always so not clear and ch always changing from day to day. My concern with you is he's trying to cut, it feels like he's trying to cut a lot of government. Betsy DeVos is trying to destroy public education. It feels like every time we see the EPA, climate change doesn't exist. What's to say he's not going to try to cut the Medicare program. I mean, you don't have an answer. I don't know if you have an answer. Yes. Right now, we're going to stay with health care. Right, right but um, that's but where yes. I'm coming from, okay. is that you came with, and I'm not saying I agree or disagree with anything. I'm just concerned. Yeah. You're right. You're right. I'm, I'm right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he is going to try, and we're going to stop him. Right, he's going to try to cut as much as he can in all areas. Gail? Hi, I'm Dr. Gail Altschuler from Marshall and Motto. And well, I had two questions. The main one, I think, for you, Jarrett, you mentioned the um, programs that are coming up to deadlines, community health, and, and things that I think a lot of people here really value. So is there something specific that we should be doing to support that or to prevent that, I guess? So yeah, for example, the community health centers, right, um, that's a big, big deal. I've got, uh, I believe it's 18 FQHCs throughout my district, mm -hmm. and that translates mm -hmm. to 72 separate locations or facilities where wow. people are getting care, often in, in remote rural areas, and, and that's a lifeline. It's the only care they're going to get. So um, I know that your community clinic uh, is part of a national association, and there's a lot of advocacy going on. There's bipartisan support to do the right thing and re-extend uh, extend this program uh, past the end of September. I believe it's a five-year extension that we're, being, we're talking about. But we've got to get it over the finish line by the end of this month. So we need that advocacy. We need the letters and, and the whole thing. Okay. I mean, is there something no, somewhere specific that we can get channeled? One of our Clinic uh, folks? Yeah, Steve is. Can you go up to the mic, please? Yeah. And very briefly, thank you. <laughs> and Gail, could you hold your second question so others can go on and then uh, we'll come back to you at the second session? Uh, the National Association of Community Health Centers has a website if you Google that. Okay. Um, there's a button where you can advocate, put in your zip and your name, and it'll go on the list. Um, it's okay. the easiest one of those I've ever done. Thank you. Okay, next person, please. Hello, my name is Anna Pletcher from Mill Valley. I'm a candidate for a district attorney here in Marin County. My question goes to mental health, which the congressman mentioned. Under either single payer or Medicare for all, is mental health coverage part of the conversation? And how real of a chance do we have of getting robust mental health coverage in our communities where we need it so badly? Thank you. It's in both. It's in the state and, the, uh, and Medicare for All plans. R robust coverage, but they don't, they don't have a budget yet, so it's hard to know. Right? Yeah, and I would mention that the county health and human services mm -hmm. have just uh, enacted a new uh, program on regarding the whole person health, which includes mental, medical, everything, and, and that's the approach really now for 
for many uh, healthcare systems even is the whole person approaching it all at once. We also have started a, a house home first initiative where it's actually putting homeless people, the first thing you do with them is put them in a house and then help them get well by providing the services, the wraparound services that are necessary. Great. But Dennis, Dennis is being modest uh, because his leadership is a key reason why the county went forward with Laura's Law. And so I think you can thank him That's for right. that, which, which will make a difference. Great. Next person, please. And while you're coming up, someone sent in the question, realistically, how many congressional Republicans would vote for a Medicare for All plan? Uh, I can count them on less than one hand right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, next Wait, question, that's before please. Before we build a national movement for Medicare for All. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not, right. this isn't in a vacuum. Right. Yeah. right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And I, I spoke a lot about the Democratic Party, but we will leave no Republican out of this movement. That's right. Okay. <laughs> next one, please, yeah. Good evening, everyone. I appreciate all being here. I'm really excited with this dialogue. Uh, as a person who's lived in Marin, Grew up here, moved away for a while, and came back. I have a, I'm, I'm having a person, being a person with a disability, I want a firsthand experience with healthcare. So, in my personal opinion, first of all, I think we need to work on single payer in California and on the national level. We need to get something going because we're in a healthcare emergency. With that said, um, for either uh, on the state level, uh, 562, or with the two bills in the federal level, have you thought about long-term services and supports like home care? How would that fit in? Congressman? You know, Judy knows the elements of each of the two bills probably better than I do. <laughs> Uh, I, I will. I, I think long-term care is included in the Sanders bill. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, then it's, it's not. in the. It's in one, but not the other. It's, it's in one, but not the other. It's in Conyers. In okay. SB 562, it says that within two years of passing, they will study a way to finance long-term care. So the Sanders bill requires you to spend down to Medicaid in order to get long-term care. That's right. Conyers includes it in the. Yeah. And Sanders' office has made statements that they're going to manage long-term care in, a se in separate legislation and not in the too distant future. Yeah. Um, I, one of the challenges is that it costs a lot of money and until you rationalize the spending across the health care system, it's hard to pay for it. But I, I actually think it's a, it should be a first-tier priority and I don't see why that demand wouldn't be a part of it, organizing a Medicare for All campaign or a 562 campaign. It really should be. In the Kuehl bill, it was given very prominent first tier status and there was a team of people w from the disability community who wrote the language and it's very possible to do it very possible you have to get organized to do it though i appreciate that i'm willing okay. to organize okay. i would just in closing i would just encourage you to really consider long-term services and supports like home care and also durable medical equipment those are really impaired <laughs> It's really imperative that people with disabilities get the equipment and support they need to yeah. be independent, live in the community. And that needs to be part of any healthcare system. And what I'm concerned about is an interruption while mm -hmm. services are being developed or bills are being passed. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, please. Well, uh, Mine's sort of a comment. One thing I never hear in the healthcare debate is anything about workers' comp and uh, workers' comp costs. And I'm in an industry with real high workers' comp costs. And it seems to me that it, it would be a real selling point to businesses to mention that, you know, the potential for dropping the bottom out of workers' comp costs with a with a me, with the medical already covered would be a, a major selling point, and I never I never hear that. And I think you know the costs are are often the negatives, and and uh, and I think businesses should get on board. Uh, you know, GMs competing against Germans and Germans and Japanese with full health care, and you know I think those issues are. Big, and I think they should be included in the conversations. 
That was actually a question that Wei Li sent in, which is why is, a, why is it that the funding doesn't also include workers' comp premium? So, Dennis? Well, I, I would just say, as a former business person um, who paid for health care for my employees and paid workers' comp, I think that the best system would be you have either or. If you're a health, if you're a, the employer who has health care fully covering your employee, you shouldn't have to pay workers' comp. And, and vice versa, if you choose not to have health care for some reason, then you should pay workers' comp because you are paying for both. Well, you said workers' comp is more than just health insurance. It is, yeah. So there would be a, a it would be, a, yeah. yeah. The, right. the medical part right. would be covered by the health care, and then there would be another portion. But I think I think there is some potential for some um, funding or revenue from the workers' comp side. So right now we're going to take two more questions on health care, but that do, you'll still have your places, meaning that when we get to the second Q&A, if we have time, you can come back and ask your questions at that time. So unless you all want to continue with health care to the end. You're the, you're the leader. Okay. We'll have two more then. My name is Chad Seligman. Uh, Lisa pointed out that we're spending $3 trillion a year on health care. About 3.5 trillion. 3.5. Just to put that in context, that's about 17 to 19 percent of our gross domestic product. The uh, other developed countries spend between 7 and 11 percent. Uh, Judy uh, went through a list of items that might be able to uh, contain those costs. But I want to say that if we only want to contain them, we are, this is going to crowd out all other ex things that the, that the country needs to do. Crowd out infrastructure, crowd out uh, you know, college costs, and any number of other things. So we have to reduce the costs. Now what I would like to know is whether you know, any of the congressional staff or the congressional budget office or anyone is actually itemizing well, what the differences in costs are quantitatively between the U.S. and the other members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Thank you. I want to make an, just one additional statement, <laughs> and that is that I'm studying the French Revolution, and health care for all or health care as a right was in the original draft of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in, eight, in 1791. And it was also included or in Chancellor uh, Bismarck, the Prussian Chancellor Bismarck, who decided that Germany needed a healthy army. Thank you. <laughs> Any, some comments on well, what's Well, first, going I, on? I hope our <laughs> democracy lives much longer than those two yeah. that you just mentioned. <laughs> Uh, I haven't seen the exact numbers, but I have seen some analyses, not just from CBO, but from other think tanks and stuff, asking the question, why do we spend so much more of our GDP than other countries? And the factors that I have seen, the big ones, uh, first, we, we actually pay our doctors more than other countries. Second, we do way more procedures. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's a cottage industry for every, every type of procedure you can imagine. And the third is the pharmaceutical industry. And we pay a lot more for our meds. Uh, a, a lot of the uh, R&D happens in our country, uh, funded by our consumers. Uh, the rest of the world gets a little bit of a free ride on some of that that happens on our dime. Okay, last question on health care. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for having this forum. My name is Rachel uh, Guinness, and I, it's wonderful to be here. I, I have a couple of um, heroes on the panel. Um, uh, Dennis uh, Rodoni, Supervisor Rodoni, has been a long time here on affordable housing and and uh, Representative Huffman on so many issues, including uh, climate change. And um, I really wanted to um, we tend to talk about the, the um, issues in isolation, and I actually wanted to draw both of those issues, affordable housing and climate change, into the issue around health care because it is a, it is a uh, expanding conversation, and as more and more people move into housing insecurity and homelessness, it has huge health care implications, and, um, and we know that um, pricing carbon, controlling carbon, carbon has a huge implication on, uh, on, on on health and human, um, and we know that 
there's talk with the citizens climate lobby about carbon fee and dividend and how it saves it saves human lives, not people defending our, our interests, but actually in, in the, from a healthcare perspective, um, grows the economy and creates jobs. And I would just love to hear um, a little conversation around uh, the intersection of those three issues and what solutions uh, might be you know, um, possible to um, help address uh, the intersection of those three issues. We're going to wait on that question until the second Q&A because okay. that's when we'll be talking about several of those other issues. But it's Brilliant. a great question great. because they all clearly impact each other. But yes, thank you. So we'll thank come you. back to that. It'll be the first question at the next Q&A. Okay, so then we'll take one more if it's just on health care. This, this might sound a little bit levity, but it's 100% truth. There was a time that I was a sponsor of soccer in San Francisco. Team, you can't put a team in the San Francisco Soccer League, but you carry the insurance. The insurance never paid off. Nobody wanted to go. The, the solution was we would hold a benefit. Everybody goes to the pub. You walk in the door, you put $20 <laughs> on the table, <clears throat> and then you go drink. That money flew the person back to Ireland. We'll see you in six months if they had anything seriously wrong with them. Anybody who had expected that the insurance company may pay went to the doctor, I mean went to the hospital, got a procedure, got a $250,000 bill, they had to move back to Ireland. So if we could expand this method, this is where the levity comes in, if we could expand this method, anybody who really needs a procedure, everybody go to the pub, as you walk in, you put twenty dollars. Well, the airlines would love it. We would fly them over to the Ukraine or Colombia or something like that, and um, that, that's the levity part of it. But the truth is, well, when somebody up there said we don't know what the insurance companies charge, I think that somebody guessed a number like twenty-five to fifty percent. We we can't be doing business that way, but it it does work for recreational <laughs> sports in San Francisco. Right. Thank you. Where we have guys going on the airplane like this. There is medical tourism. I'm sure most people there have heard about it. Idea. Okay, now we still will have some questions about healthcare, but I, we do want to take the opportunity to have um, both our supervisor, Dennis Rodoni, as well as our congressman, Jared Huffman, to talk about there are a lot of issues that are facing not just West Marin, but the country as a whole. So we just wanted to open it up for some dialogue, and again, we'll have some time for a Q&A at the end of it. So um, think about questions you have about some other issues, but this is a wonderful opportunity that we can have a, a more expansive view and start connecting the dots, you know, between, for example, climate change and our health. I mean, that's kind of like a, a very clear connection. So, mm -hmm. Congressman. Well, uh, I want to uh, save as much time for your questions as possible, so maybe what I'll just do to kick this off is attempt to answer the question that was just posed about climate change and housing as uh, parts of the bigger uh, challenge that we face, uh, having a healthy country and a healthy planet. Uh, Dennis is closer to the front lines on the housing piece of that question, uh, but on the climate change piece, uh, you know, I just came back from Washington last night after a week where the two most intense storms we've ever seen you know, wrecked the Gulf Coast and, and Florida. Uh, we're going to have to do a lot of thinking about uh, things like flood insurance, about climate resiliency. We're going to have to somehow draw Republicans into a conversation about these things, even though Scott Pruitt and others are saying it's terribly insensitive to talk about climate change right now. Well, it's, it's kind of obvious that we have to talk about climate change right now. Uh, so we're going to keep pushing. I do support pricing of carbon any way we can get there. Okay, so now, uh, you know, maybe a little bit like the variants of single-payer health care and Medicare for all, there are variants on how you price carbon. And so you've got some purists who believe that California's cap-and-trade system is an abomination and, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't work and we need to go to a, a more pure model, whether it's a fee and dividend or a carbon tax or whatever, I'm for whatever we can get. Let me just be real clear. If I can get to a fee and dividend, that's one, it's a beautiful, elegant model. I think it would be highly successful. 
But I want California to hang on to the modest carbon pricing that we've got with our cap and trade system right now and keep building on that. Um, and I'm going to be defending California back in Washington because we've got an EPA right now that would love to take away the waivers and the other things that have enabled California to lead the world uh, on, on climate change. And we're going to have to fight that fight uh, in a big, big way. But also, I'll keep pushing on the federal level to get carbon pricing. We may be able to do it as part of transportation infrastructure because right now, federal transportation funding, about 40 percent of what the state of California spends on roads, bridges, public transit, et cetera, come from the federal gas tax that hasn't been raised since 1993. It's, it's a terrible revenue source to attach to for the long term because we are becoming more efficient in the way we use gasoline and we're introducing, thankfully, all sorts of new fuels like electricity. So you don't want to rely on the gas tax for the long haul and the decline of that revenue stream is going to give us an opportunity to talk about something different. And I've introduced a carbon tax for transportation fuels that would look at the life cycle greenhouse gas effect of all transportation fuel sources and get us into the carbon pricing game. So we'll keep working on that. I'm also throwing out some very, very bold measures, like uh, I'm, I'm one of the lead authors in the House of the 100 percent renewable bill, 100 by 50. I, I'm the author of a bill called the Keep It in the Ground Act that actually listens, uh, listens to the science and uh, recognizes that we know if we're going to keep this planet habitable, we have to keep 80 percent of the known fossil reserves in the ground. So we need to start by locking up our public lands and our shores. And so we're going to phase out fossil fuel extraction from all of it. This is very bold and audacious, but I've got something like 44 co-sponsors on the Keep It in the Ground Act in the, in the House. So we're going to work on all of that. I'll, I'll keep trying to bring some federal housing dollars to the table so Dennis can do good things on the housing piece of your question, but I'll, I'll pass to him on, on that for the most part. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. <clears throat> yeah, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, Health and Human Services, working with the whole person, act, um, whole person approach, finding housing first is all part of that program. The county, at the same time, as you may know, uh, has entered into a lawsuit against the gas and oil companies. Uh, similar to the tobacco suit, we want them to be accountable and actually pay for some of the climate change and, and sea level rise that we're going to be experiencing here in Marin and other counties will join the suit and I think the state may even join that suit. So that'll be interesting. Um, you know, the county's struggling with affordable housing though, as Rachel will tell you, Rachel's been a leader, as has Kim and Clam. And we're doing much better in West Marin, actually, when it comes to affordable housing and actually making a difference. Um, it's not enough, but thanks to Congressman Huffman and his staff, soon we're going to be working on a, a Coast Guard project yeah. that will come to this community and be affordable housing for, for the whole community, which will be a great project. We're getting closer. I just learned today that the appraisal actually has been sent to the Coast Guard, and we expect a decision in two to six months from them about accepting the appraisal, and, and I know the Congressman right. will be interested in that. Thank you. <clears throat> Countywide, though, we have trouble building anything big and dense. Uh, there's just too much opposition. So we've moved to a, to a local approach, really, and that is the redevelopment of downtown uh, parcels where um, we fi we're finding that commercial lower floors with multi-residential above of all levels, affordable workforce and market seems to be the pattern that is acceptable to most, most communities. San Rafael has a couple of those projects going right now. Novato has a couple on the planning table. And so, I, you know, that's going to be Marin's approach. The county, uh, you know, is, is working hard on changing some of its development codes around uh, JDUs, junior units, and second units. The state passed a law last year, January 1, which makes developing those very easy. Um, we have a little problem called septic systems in West Marin that doesn't make that so easy. And so from day one, I've been working with Rachel and Environmental Health Services to figure out how, how you can put a, a junior unit, change a bedroom into a rental, basically, and avoid uh, septic restraints or septic requirements. And we're getting close. I'm having a meeting Monday morning. I think I have a final determination from environmental health that if you change a bedroom into a, a rental and have a private door, you won't have to do anything with your septic system. So it's a big step, big step. Yeah. 
People have general questions, please feel free yeah. to line up or other yeah, healthcare I'll, I'll questions. I'll stop there. As I well. had a lot of stuff no, no, to talk to you going, about. No, no, keep going, Dennis, okay, on well, the other local issues. Yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about a couple other things yes. that are important to West Marin, and Congressman Huffman has been an important role in this too, and that's the, the rural communities are underserved when it, are not served when it comes to broadband and internet, mm -hmm. and he's been a leader at, at, in Washington on this, and the county has been a leader in this with three, three neighboring counties. Uh, we're really close, well, we're, we're really close. We're, we're starting a project in the Casho this year, installing broadband to 220 homes in the Casho, which will be expanded to the farm community so farm workers' children can actually do their homework on the farm mm -hmm. in the Casho. Uh, wow. Our next project, we hope, and we have till January to make this happen, is Bolinas is in line for a four and a half million dollar grant from the state to bring broadband to Bolinas. Um, I say we hope because just yesterday the Senate in California passed 32 to 2 with Senator McGuire, our senator, voting against it, a broadband package which would eliminate state funding for such projects. And really, really sad. They don't understand the rural community's needs. AT&T and Frontier pushed it through. We fought, we fought. I've never done this before, but yesterday my staff developed a floor alert. I've never done this before, but it's where you take a page, one page, and put everything on it that's important, and your uh, consultant in Sacramento takes and drops it on every senator's desk. Well, unfortunately, the only senator to listen was the one that already was listening to us, Senator McGuire. <clears throat> and we lost 32 to 2, I think it was, at the end. The assembly had till 1 o'clock this morning, and so I'm waiting, actually, to get a text to see if they pass it. If perhaps they make it a two-year bill in the assembly, we've got some chances for our local community to get some more grant funding. Yeah, so. Um, other, thing that's going, other things that are going on is protecting our villages and our coastline, uh, figuring out the tourist impacts. Uh, from oversized housing developments to uh, finding more affordable housing. Uh, as I said, we're working with the congressman on the Coast Guard. We're working with affordable housing groups, real community rentals that CLAM, the program they're running, is a county program to encourage people to develop rentals for, for full-time residents, to uh, talk about full-time renting their houses, and then we're also in the midst, I'm on a subcommittee that's dealing with the short-term rental aspect and trying to figure out some of those things around short-term rentals and their impacts on affordable housing and all housing. So those are many of the things we're working on at the county. The important things I wanted to tell you tonight are two things. Very soon the county will be talking about what I call tenant rights and responsibilities, also known as just cause eviction. Um, you need to come to that meeting when we have it at the Board of Supervisors and stand up strong that we need a just cause or a tenant rights uh, ordinance in this county. And uh, I think we need your support to convince some other supervisors of that, so I'm mentioning it tonight. Um, the other thing that's coming up is Measure A funds not only park acquisitions, but a tremendous 20% of malt acquisitions is funded by Measure A, which you passed about seven years ago. It's due for renewal next year, and I think you keep an eye on that and support that. And I want to mention also, uh, from day one, we've been supportive of Marin Kids and Marin Strong Start, which was the child care or um, preschool initiative that Jenny uh, ran so well. Fortunately, it didn't pass because of the two-thirds requirements. We're hoping that comes back in 2018 and give you another shot at supporting that too. Really important, not only for preschool, but also childcare for all working parents. Um, as I said, other projects going on in West Marin. Bolinas may have an opportunity to, to uh, take over the uh, College of Marin Bolinas Lab on Wharf Road. We're going to the College Board next week and we're asking them to put that on a surplus. Um, Inverness is uh, looking at a project on Chicken Ranch Beach. Finally, we're looking at getting a project there with the uh, Watershed Council and other landowners. Point Reyes is getting an expanded HHS building, which will expand the programs here, and also um, the personal care programs for West Marin. And Tamales is getting a new fire station next year. So we've been busy. Hey. Wow. Yeah. Dennis has been busy. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Judy has a question for uh, Congressman Huffman. Oh, good. I, I wanted, and again, go to the mic if you have questions, please. I wanted to ask what you might know about the, what, we hear that, the, um, what's his name, Trump, wants to drill offshore here oh, yes. in California. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what do, you, what do you know about that? Is that going to happen? I mean, what, what's going on? So there's no doubt in my mind they want to do more drilling off the California right. coast. I've had a couple of conversations with the new Interior Secretary about this. Um, I don't know how direct a threat that represents to us here in the north, but if I lived anywhere near Santa Barbara, I'd be very mm -hmm. concerned because the Santa Barbara Channel Islands area, uh, Secretary Zinke's brought that up twice in conversations with me, and he trots out this old industry trope that's totally bunk, where he talks about natural seepage in the ocean in that area. I went to UC Santa Barbara, by the way, and I, I still have tar between my toes, because there, there actually is a lot of oil out there. But the idea that if they drill more oil, it, it eliminates the natural seepage is complete bunk. But, but our Secretary of Interior was trotting out this old industry trope for me right there, twice. Uh, so I think they're real interested in the California coast, and he's announced that they're going to spend some money even as they're slashing environmental programs throughout the Department of Interior's budget, they're going to spend a whole bunch of new money developing a new leasing plan for the West Coast. So we need to be very vigilant. Any, okay, let's have one or two more questions and then we're going to let the panelists just do some final comments. It looks like we have three people and then we'll stop after you. Okay, well thank you for taking a second question. I appreciate that. Uh, my question is, my, my passion is really around climate change and what we're doing about that. And I'm really curious about, anyone can answer, but specifically uh, Congressman Huffman, from a perspective of someone here who hasn't been to Washington, what in your mind has been difficult about having any kind of dialogue, reasonable dialogue around issues? What are the stopping points and what, have, what do you feel has not been effective and has been effective in that dialogue for you? Well, the, the difficulty is that climate change is manifesting itself uh, everywhere we look and we still can't get uh, our friends across the aisle serious about it. Uh, there are some very cosmetic efforts that are starting to take shape uh, in the House. There is this, this Republican-led caucus called the Climate Solutions Caucus. Uh, there's a handful of Republicans who have signed on to the principles that they came up with. If you read those principles, uh, you would be really underwhelmed. It's like, the weather's getting really bad, and we're concerned, and maybe we should study it, but we shouldn't do anything to hurt the economy. Uh, and if you ask these folks to ever do anything, uh, the answer is usually, you know, no, I don't want to do anything. Uh, now, one exception to that is my colleague Carlos Curbelo from the Miami, Florida area. He has actually joined me on some uh, letters and even on some tough votes in the House. So I'm, I'm pleased to see Carlos and, you know, a very small number of other Republicans beginning to take some action as opposed to just do this cosmetic stuff with their caucus. But uh, I am frustrated that, uh, that we haven't seen more progress. And I'm also reluctant to give them too much credit for forming this caucus because it's almost entirely cosmetic. You've got folks like Daryl Issa who have joined the Climate Solutions Caucus. So it's, it's real greenwashing. Next question. Oh, thank you. I'm Jenny Pfeiffer from Molinas. I want to say thank you for working so hard on our behalf, all of you. Uh, this is the keep it, keep it in the ground issue and it, how it impacts health and the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Two issues that are um, very important here in California. One is, of course, water. Water is always an issue and earthquakes are another issue. And um, there's a, um, we are not allowed to know what chemicals are going into the fracking. This is a fracking uh, comment. Um, and also the um, resulting earthquakes that seem to happen with fracking. I wonder if anyone's tracking fracking in, um, in areas in the state where that is going on in terms of what's happening with those waters, the wastewaters, how that's impacting our water issues. And also, I, I just heard that we had six earthquakes just around San Jose just in the la yesterday. And I'm thinking, okay, is this something that is going to be continuing? Are we, um, I, I would like to know if anyone's paying attention to that and what can be done about that. Thank you. Well, they're certainly tracking the seismic relationship in places like Oklahoma that didn't used to have earthquakes. And I, I think everybody understands that fracking has dramatically changed uh, the seismic activity in those places. 
Look, I, I'm opposed to fracking. I think all of whether it's the transparency of what's in the fracking fluid or the risks to groundwater and surface water contamination, lots of reasons uh, to, to try to do a lot more here in California. But to me, the bigger fight is against fossil fuels. And so I'm really focusing a lot of my efforts on just trying to hasten our transition away from fossil fuels. Uh, as, as long as we rely heavily on fossil fuels, you're going to see an awful lot of fracking because it's by far the most efficient way to get this stuff out of the ground. And so, to me, the faster we can just make this transition, uh, the better we're going to be, whether it's our concerns about fracking, earthquakes, the water issues, you name it. Let's let the person behind you go, because she hasn't um, asked a question yet, and then we'll come back to you. Thank you. I just want to add, before you, you ask your question, um, the other side of that question is around earthquakes, and um, I want to mention that Emergency preparedness is so important, and we're seeing it all over the states right now. Um, we need to do a better job at that. The county's working hard to encourage the communities to get involved. Alertmarin.org is a way that you can have a notification on your phone of anything going on in, the, in your community. Even if you move, it follows you and gives you a message where you are. And you also can put your home address in it, and it'll tell you about information you need to know about your home, too, uh, or the home area. So sign up for that, but be part of your neighborhood group. Get involved, because um, we're going to be probably on our, our own for three to five days uh, when we have a major earthquake. And I know we hate to think about it, but earthquakes have been more regular. And that's why I said they're probably getting more predictable than Donald Trump, because uh, they're happening more and more often. So. We have just a few minutes left for questions, so please. Um, I have, uh, during the election, I somehow called someone about an investment, and they told me about an area in Alaska that as soon as Trump was elected, they were going to take the protection away from it and have a very big gold mining industry there. And that uh, if I invested in his plan, oh, we'd be making millions of dollars. Thank you. And have you heard anything about that in Washington? <laughs> that sounds like any given day in Washington, actually. Uh, whether it's Bristol Bay or the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge, I mean, uh, Don Young has these wild fantasies about the Arctic becoming this mineral utopia that'll make everyone in Alaska fabulously rich. I mean, everyone's got crazy ideas about extracting wealth out of Alaska. And I'm going I'm to fight to make sure that their investment is, uh, is an absolute bomb. <laughs> okay. The, the now, what about the bear's ears? Thank what you. is the chance that we're going to keep it protected? So it depends what... It, I mean, there's several major threats in Alaska. Um, there actually is some bipartisan support for wilderness on the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge. It's one of the few areas where I've been able to get a half dozen or so Republicans to come. I'm the lead author of the Arctic Refuge bill. And uh, we're, we're going to keep pushing that. And I, I think we win a few elections, we might be able to permanently protect the coastal plain, which is where the porcupine caribou herd you know, depends on, and it's a really unique and special place. Um, in terms of the waters off the coast, the Chukchi Sea and, and uh, other areas in the Arctic that are up for leasing, Trump is going to do his best to open all that up. Uh, it's, a, it's a really fraught place for oil companies to even do exploration. Shell, the last time they went out, uh, you know, had to, had to pick up their boat and, and call the Coast Guard for rescue, because it's, it's a really remote <laughs> and difficult area. Uh, between that and our ability to litigate, I think we can probably, as long as this is a one-term presidency, we can probably protect most of that area. Then there's Bristol Bay and the Pebble Mine and all this. Stuff. Don't even get me started. Alaska's at risk, and we got a lot of fighting to do. We're going to do it in Washington uh, through my work. We're going to do it in the courts, and hopefully when we get more favorable, uh, a more favorable administration, we'll lock in some permanent protections. So Thank we only have much. time for two more questions, so let's wrap this up. 
Very quick questions, please. Hello. So uh, thank you again. Um, this has just been tremendous. Um, I had a question about um, about tax reform. Uh, we're interest, we're entering very curious waters as the Democrats have um, put forward, you know, pushed forward the issue of tax reform. And what most people don't know that, and I'm so sorry, I actually founded the the Marin chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby, so I'm a horrible. Yeah. Uh, of persistent advocate on this, and I just wonder, most people don't realize that uh, a, a steadily rising fee, a tax on carbon, is a Republican proposal. It actually was... Republicans who are no longer in office. I, told, I totally understand, but I just wonder, is it a conversation uh, that might come, because I, I have been having that conversation with on Capitol Hill uh, with Republicans, and, and I just wonder if it's a conversation that might play out as they look at tax reform. Thank you. Thank you. Look, we'll keep pushing, and, and you can get a few of them to have the conversation with you. Again, though, there's, there's sort of a hard stop when it comes to taking action, and we're just not there right now. Maybe we can build more Republican support in the years ahead, and eventually it'll have to be like revenue neutral. You know, they've, all the caveats they always attach to it. But sure, if we could do that with Republicans, I'd be thrilled. Final question. Chad Seligman again on climate change. I'm the uh, primary researcher working with Bell Cole of the Organization for American Marin, on, uh, primary researcher on climate change. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your uh, keep it in the ground. Uh, you're, you're, that's what NASA scientist James Hansen uh, promoted that, you know, um, one eighth of the res we shouldn't use more than one eighth of the hydrocarbons that we already know about and not go looking for more. How are we going to make America great if we allow China to dominate renewables? They already produce two-thirds of the solar panels that are used in the world, and that's going to be the largest industry you know, in the 21st century. America will not be great if we are number two or three in the largest industry in the world. Thank you. That's a final question. So, Congressman Hoffman? I would like to respond to that, because there's a temptation uh, to criticize China for dumping cheap solar panels into the United States, and certainly I would prefer that American manufacturers were making all those. Um, but there's actually uh, an issue coming up before uh, the Trump administration very soon that you should know about. They are going to have an opportunity to impose a tariff on China for the dumping of those cheap solar panels. And this uh, is absolutely a wolf in sheep's clothing because uh, it's a twofer for them. He gets to look tough on China and he gets to stick it to renewables because it would drive the price of solar panels way up. And the Koch brothers will be very happy about that. Uh, the, the silver lining, uh, if you will, of those cheap Chinese solar panels is that solar has become affordable in the United States and the solar industry has grown fantastically. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, probably level the playing field a little better for American manufacturers. Most of them have gone out of business anyway. Uh, so it's pretty much just the Chinese and a few other countries, uh, Korea, uh, uh, that, are, that are manufacturing these panels at this point. But this is a bad time to impose tariffs that, that cause the price of solar to go way up, just as we're beginning to succeed. Final one-minute comment by each of the panelists, if you wish. Yeah, enough. Enough. Anyone? Well, I, I take off my supervisor hat and put on my liberal citizen hat. And all the discussions we're having about the federal government and the spending and the money available, in my mind, as long as we have the military complex that we're supporting, we'll never ever get all these other problems solved. They're spending too much money on the military. We, don't, we need to protect ourselves in a reasonable and efficient way, but we need to spend more money in our communities. That is an amazing place to stop. <laughs> So I would like to just take a moment, and I think what Judy said at the very beginning, thanking so much that Congressman Huffman was able to join us, flew back in last night, and also Supervisor Rodoni, we can sense your passions about all of these issues, and that's really quite heartening because so many of us wake up every day and are just slammed by the newest news out of D.C. And thank you so much, Ellen and Judy, for all the work that you have both been doing in healthcare. I mean, health care clearly should be a right, and everyone should have access to it. So thank you very much.
It's been a great evening and really oh. filled with a tremendous amount of information. And now I want to turn the mic back over to our fearless founder, <laughs> Bing Gong, who thank has you. a few final comments to make. Yeah. Before we close, I'd like to thank some folks. Uh, I'd like to thank the West Marin Standing Together Healthcare Committee for organizing tonight's event. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Madeline Hope and the Tomales Bay Youth Group for helping set up the chairs for tonight's event. <laughs> and uh, Paul Knight for providing the sound engineering. Yeah, yeah. And the Community Media Center of Marin for ta videotaping, which should be archived on their website uh, later. And uh, KWMR for recording tonight. And please join us on Saturday, October 14th at the Dance Palace for an evening of levity with political satirist Will Durst. And uh, before you leave, if you haven't already, uh, please reach into your pockets and make a donation to help pay for this evening's expenses and to support Westmoreland Standing Together. Uh, there are donation baskets at the uh, exit doors. And we would appreciate some help tonight uh, folding up the chairs if you have uh, some time. Uh, the wooden chairs, if you fold them up and put them sort of against that corner there, would be very helpful. And the uh, blue plastic chairs, I'm not sure, that side or that side? Uh, fold them up against the wall and that'll help us to put them away. So I'd really appreciate that. Thank you all for coming tonight. and. Uh, Peace and <laughs> goodwill.